a conversation with a man who had a front row seat at the impeachment trial of Donald Trump. Major funding for On the Record with Michael Aaron is provided by the Fuel Merchants Association of New Jersey, the National Oil Heat Research Alliance and BioHeat, the evolution of oil heat, NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Promotional support is provided by Insider NJ, a political intelligence network dedicated to New Jersey political news. Insider NJ is committed to giving serious political players an interactive forum for ideas, discussion, and insight. Online at InsiderNJ.com. Funding for Governor's Perspectives with Kent Manahan is made possible by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, committed to helping Americans lead healthier lives and get the care they need. Additional funding provided by Connell Foley, LLP, Seton Hall University, and Seton Hall Law, and by New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group. Matt Platkin is Governor Phil Murphy's chief counsel. He took a leave from the governor's office recently to serve as special counsel to Senator Cory Booker, during the impeachment trial of President Trump. He's back in Trenton now, one of the governor's most trusted lieutenants and advisors, and he's our guest this week. Later in the program, Kent Manahan talks to former Governor Jim Florio about the Superfund program. Matt, good to see you here. Thank you for having me, Michael. Why would Cory Booker, who must have a staff of 20 to 40 people in D.C., turn to you to sit at his side during impeachment? Well, first of all, Senator Booker has a phenomenal staff. We've obviously borrowed from some of them. Our chief of staff, George Helmy, uh, current Governor Murphy's chief of staff, uh, came from Senator Booker's world. I worked for Senator Booker's team uh, back in 2013 uh, and have some strong relationships there. But this was an unprecedented moment in American history. And it it was a moment where, despite how much I've enjoyed and continue to enjoy working for and representing Governor Murphy, Uh, It was a moment where I felt like I needed to do more and get involved in Washington. And Senator Booker uh, felt that he had a need uh, to bring on some help as he navigated uh, truly, like I said, an unprecedented and challenging uh, question as to whether the president should be impeached and removed from office. Did you sit next to Booker on the Senate floor? Did you stay in his office and watch CNN? Uh, What was your actual live experience with the proceedings? So the Senate was unusually restricted during the impeachment trial. There was no staff, with the very few exceptions, allowed on the floor. Uh, The staff were either in the galleries, and I I spent a good amount of time watching from the gallery, uh, particularly as uh, the House Democrats made what was truly a historic and compelling case about how this president uh, abused his office uh, to promote his own political interest. So I watched a fair amount from the gallery, and then we would spend a lot of time watching on, on, on closed circuit television and analyzing and preparing both for what the senator was going to deal with that night or that morning, as well as thinking through the questions he might ask and ultimately how he might vote on certain votes and what he might say. Uh, as a neutral observer, it looked to me like 10 days of overkill. Uh, the, the same point was pounded into the American psyche for every day for 10 days, and that is that the president, uh, by promising, uh, the president withholding military aid unless the president of Ukraine would launch an investigation into the Bidens. I must have heard that 100,000 times in 10 days, and I wasn't sure that that was worth removing a president from the United States a president of the United States from office, uh, just in terms of the of rising to the level of an impeachable crime, you obviously disagree. Why? Well, I, I think if you go back and look at what the founders of this country were principally worried about when they wrote our Constitution, at the foremost of their concerns was to combat the corrosive impact of corruption. And they were particularly concerned about corruption of a kind that invited foreign interference into our domestic politics and our domestic elections. And that was at the heart of this case. You had a president who was using his office to further his political interests by inviting a foreign power to interfere with our elections. 
it was a fundamental challenge to our republic. And at the same time, when Congress legitimately asked him questions about those acts, for the first time in history, the president and his office refused to cooperate whatsoever with congressional requests or congressional subpoenas. But, but it was a losing cause from the outset uh, because the Senate is controlled by the Republican Party and you would have had to find uh, the president shooting someone on Fifth Avenue, so to speak, in order to really win Republican votes to throw him out of office. Did well, you disagree? Well, I think what you heard from the House managers and what you heard from the senators, and by, par by the way, bipartisan senators voted to remove him from office. Mitt Senator Mitt Romney from Utah did vote to remove him. Uh, and what a, you heard bi a bipartisan senator, senator won. That, that's correct, but still a significant vote. And if you listen to what he said on the floor and what the Democrats said throughout these proceedings, is this isn't a question of political self-interest. There are still in this country, at least I hope there are, norms and, and, and ideals that matter to the people of, of, of the United States. And if we're going to have a government, if people are going to have trust in our government, and this is true in New Jersey, I know we'll get to that in a second, just as much as it is in Washington, then they have to feel that even the most powerful person in the country is subject to the same rules that every president has been subject to since the beginning of our, of our country. And I, I would just point out, I agree with you that there may have been some repetition, but this was the shortest impeachment trial of any president in the history of our country. It was the first impeachment trial of any president or judge to not involve witnesses or documents during a Senate trial. And it was the first time that the Senate was forced to vote on a vote of conviction without the benefit of a full record. Uh, John Bolton could have come and testified before the House. I, I don't know why he didn't. Uh, I wondered while watching whether uh, the Democrats would try to get Rudy Giuliani on the stand. They never, they wanted Bolton, but they never tried to get Giuliani. Is that because Giuliani's discussions with the president are, are privileged, uh, lawyer-client privilege? Well, I think there are some very interesting and somewhat technical questions around privilege in this case, both for Mr. Giuliani as well as uh, for other members of the administration. Um, but you, just to take a step back, you had Ambassador Bolton, the highest ranking uh, national security advisor in the White House, raising his hand and saying, I want to come in to testify. Testify to facts that put the president directly at the heart of the scheme. And you had a majority of, of Republicans in the Senate uh, say, we don't want to hear from him. And, and I think that's a really troubling moment for this country. It concerned me when it was happening, and as I've been back and thinking about it more, it concerns me about not just for this president, but for all presidents that come forward. If the Democrats had been successful, uh, we'd have Pre President Pence today. Is that an outcome that you Democrats talked about among yourselves? Uh, again, there, it wasn't a, a matter of whether this was good politically or whether one person being in the office was better than the other. The question really is, is the president subject to the rules that presidents have been held to since the beginning of this country? Can he openly invite foreign interference into our domestic elections? And then when asked about it, when caught, deny any and all questions, use blanket assertions of executive privilege and immunity, which are not founded in law, to obstruct an investigation? And the answer should be to that question, and we should all feel this way regardless of party, the answer should be no. Let me ask you about yourself. Uh, where do you come from? What's your schooling? Yeah. What's your professional background? So I grew up in Morris County. Uh, I'm a fourth generation New Jerseyan. Uh, I, I'm raising a fifth generation a few miles from where my dad grew up. Um, I went to public school all my life until I uh, was uh, lucky enough to get into Stanford. I went to California, did two tours of duty out there for college and law school with a stint in Washington in between. And then I moved back home, which is um, Shortly thereafter was when I, um, I met uh, Governor Murphy. How did you meet Governor Murphy? So as I mentioned, I had worked for Senator Booker in 2013, and through some friends in, in that campaign, I was connected to uh, then, can well, not even candidate at the time, Phil Murphy, in late 2014, early 2015. Uh, and when I first met with him, um, I wasn't looking for a job. I, had, I was enjoying being in private practice. And I said that everything I have is a result of decisions made by people who sat in the seat that I expected he may consider running for, for governor. And I felt that the past couple of decades in our state, uh, things that were fundamental to who we are, our education, our infrastructure, uh, were put at risk by decisions made out of political self-interest rather than the interest 
of the 9 million people. And I said very simply to him, if you're looking to be the kind of governor who gets us back on the right track, then I would be honored to help you. And he said to me, uh, I, that's exactly, if I do run, that is exactly why I would run. And I, we, my wife and I had one car at the time, so we were joking. Uh, she drove me down. She waited outside. When I met with him, I walked out, and I said, I want to go work for him. What year was that? That was in 2015. Uh, what don't we know about Phil Murphy? We. What do you know that we don't know? I, I think with Governor Murphy, what you see is what you get. He is someone who deeply cares about this state. I, I've served as policy director for uh, his organization, New Way for New Jersey. I served as policy director for his campaign for the duration, and now I serve as his chief counsel. I have never had a conversation with him about an important substantive decision that we were making in the campaign or in government where he put politics ahead of the best interests of the people. That's one. And the second thing that I think everyone needs to know, because it's truly genuine, I've never seen anyone in business and politics who is more devoted and more steadfast in maintaining time uh, for his family. They are central to who he is. They are part of our team. His, the First Lady is a critical uh, leader in our state, and his, his kids, four, four kids, are, are all active participants in what we're doing. Because he loses temper every now and then. I can't recall him, him losing his temper in any way other than every one of us has with general frustration, but nothing uh, uh, of the sort that would be unusual. He is a very disciplined, he is a wonderful boss, a great manager, and very focused on making the state a better place. You told me when we spoke earlier this week that uh, you've been through some tough fights with Governor Murphy. Like what? Yeah. Look, Governor Murphy is not someone who, and I'm of this camp too, we don't come from decades of uh, uh, political circles. We don't, this isn't about settling scores, but he did come with a very clear mandate, come into office with a very clear mandate to bring change to Trenton and to say that the way things had been done, particularly under the last administration, but certainly for far too long, uh, were not the way that we should continue. That this transactional, you get this, I get that, has led to a state that was broke, that wasn't investing in the people that make this state great, our middle and working class, and change was required to fix that. Isn't and, you get this, I get that, the essence of politics, horse trading, getting the, legislation passed? There's always an element. Lyndon, Lyndon Johnson style? The, there is always an element of that, but we took it to an extreme here. We perfected the art. And what we had, when we took, when we took office in 2018, we had a budget that basically had no surplus. Uh, we had an economy, and this is critical to think about, an economy where the average household in New Jersey saw its income decline from 2010 to 2017. Now, in 2010, we were beginning to emerge from the worst recession in the history of uh, the last 70 years of this country. And yet, if you were a middle or working class family in New Jersey, as the rest of the country recovered from that recession, you fell further and further into a hole. And it was particularly challenging, particularly bad for households of color. And so we came in and said, we have to get back to what made this state great. We have to invest in education. We have to invest in infrastructure. We have to restore a sense of ethics and trust in our government. And we have to make sure that we are being both progressive and fiscally responsible. And, and I'll be honest with you, a lot of people said what we were talking about was pie in the sky stuff, that we had promised something to everybody, that it was unrealistic. And what we've shown two plus years in, almost three budgets now on Tuesday, is that what the governor said he could, could do and would do is exactly what he has done. And a lot of critics said that you were all too young and that none of you, except former Chief of Staff Pete Camerano, had any State House experience. Uh, do you think the team has gotten older and wiser and better in the three years or two and a half years you've been down there? Well, I'm older and wiser. My, my wife found her some gray hairs recently. So, uh, look, I, there was a lot of talk about that. And, and Chief of Staff Pete Camerano did a great job bringing institutional knowledge and credibility as we set up the government. I think one of the things that governor has done that's been effective is he has a little bit of a mix. If you look throughout his cabinet, throughout our front office, and throughout uh, state government more broadly, we have folks who have been there for a long time, who know where, I mean, we all know where the bathrooms are, but who at the start knew where things were, knew how things worked. And then he brought people in, and I'm in this camp, who maybe had a little bit of a different perspective and a fresh approach. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think government should, there is an important part of how government functions that it relies on institutional precedent, and we respect that, and we certainly respect the role the legislature plays. And, and despite what you hear, I think we work 
better with them than, than uh, you might think. But there's also a role for creative thinking and for new ideas and for saying like, hey, maybe what's happened over the last 20 years that resulted in a state that went from AAA rating to nearly broke and was no longer investing in education or infrastructure or transportation, maybe somebody might want to come in and bring some new energy and new ideas to see if we can fix that. Is there a toxic culture somewhere within the Murphy administration or was there during the Murphy campaign? We've been reading press pieces now for six weeks about uh, the, the governor's attempt to improve what looks to some like a misogynistic workplace. So we've all read the reports over the past weeks and months. Um, I don't think it was just unique to Governor Murphy, but we've all read them. And it's been, as the governor said, a period of intense uh, reflection for all of us. And I'm included in that. It certainly has been for me. These reports are unacceptable uh, and they're deeply upsetting. And everyone who works in state government or anywhere else has the absolute right uh, to come into work every day and feel safe and feel respected and heard and free from any form of harassment or discrimination. And, and that's why the governor, working with the legislature, has already implemented a series of important reforms uh, to how we handle complaints within state government. He's announced that he's going to bring on expert counsel to advise all of government as to how to be best in class in terms of how we handle these procedures. And just on Tuesday, he stood with uh, the Coalition Against Sexual Assault, Garden State Equality, and announced a series of additional reforms that he's going to work with Senator Loretta Weinberg to sponsor to strengthen our sexual harassment laws and make sure that every employer, public and private, has best-in-class training for its employees. But it's also important to recognize that what the governor has said is that this is part, and unfortunately an all too pervasive example, of why we need to change how business is done in Trenton. If we just have the strongest sexual harassment and discrimination laws in the country, and we should and we will, that won't in and of itself cure the problems that we're talking about. We also have to make sure that everyone from every community has a right to be at the table and making decisions in our government. And that's a big reason why on, on Wednesday night, the day after he announced the sexual harassment reforms, he announced a series, the first in a generation proposal to change the way we handle ethics in our government. A series of important reforms to open government up and bring more people in. And uh, we, we have a clip of the governor praising you for your work on that. Let's play that clip quickly. I could thank a lot of people in my orbit, but I could thank none more, with more passion and conviction than our chief counsel, Matt Placken, who has been with me from almost day one and has been a leader in getting us to tonight. So, Matt, thank you. So you uh, spearheaded the ethics reform package, which some of which requires legislators to provide the same le level of disclosure as executive branch employees like you have to provide. That looks like a thrust against the legislature in the ongoing tug of war between Governor Murphy and the Senate president and the assembly speaker. So this is not meant to be a political football. We are raising standards on ourselves. There are provisions in the proposals that we have that will require us to, to tighten our belts and make sure that we are uh, holding ourselves to the highest possible standards. And then there are pieces of the proposals that ask uh, the legislature to do the same. And by, by the way, it, the legislation that we are proposing is sponsored by bipartisan collection of legislators already. Um, and, and this is not about who, who's winning or who's losing. It's about in 2020, people need to believe that our government, the government that goes to work in Trenton every single day, is doing their business. Because there's a fundamental reality, that bad process, and when our small d democratic processes break down, that it doesn't, it's not just some insider problem that affects a few people in the state house. It results in bad outcomes for all 9 million residents. It's how we ended up in a place, like I said, where we weren't investing in education, where we weren't investing in transportation, where we were asking, where we were not asking millionaires to pay more than their middle class and working class neighbors in their taxes. I mean, that is a breakdown in our dem small d democratic processes and the ethics reform package that the governor put forward with a bipartisan collection of legislators supporting him uh, is to address that fundamental issue. Matt Pelican, we're out of time. Thanks so much for sharing your views with us. Thanks for having me, Michael. Former Governor Jim Florio authored the Superfund legislation in 1980, 40 years ago, while serving in Congress. 
In Governor's Perspectives, he talks to Kent Manahan about what was and what's changed. New Jersey has more toxic waste sites than any other state in the country. Governor Florio, why is that? Well, most people don't remember, but up until the 1950s, New Jersey was really the center of the chemical industry and the petrochemical industry. We had re refineries all through the state. And in those days, there were no environmental laws, so people just disposed of their waste products wherever they wanted to, taking things out to the woods. Well, those woods became the sites for housing projects and so on. So all these things are residual leftovers from the days when chemicals and petrochemicals were being produced in the state of New Jersey. You've had a long history uh, of environmental issues and your concerns. And when you were in Congress, you were the author of the Superfund legislation back in 1980. Have you been satisfied with the way things have turned out? Well, obviously it's a big improvement over what it was. We had no laws whatsoever. People just randomly disposed of things. I can remember down in Camden, the uh, State Street dump was a place where I remember seeing trucks pull up open the spigots, just turn loose uh, all kinds of waste products. We've challenged that, we've changed that. You can't randomly do that. Nowadays, you do that sort of stuff, you go to jail. Um, but cleaning up the messes is still a job that's not done yet. How did you open up the minds of people to understand the, the consequences? My congressional district had more Superfund sites in than any other congressional district in the nation because of the chemical industry and the refineries that were there. So we had to get about the job of cleaning up because our air and our water and our land had been so polluted. Now the Environmental Protection Agency has taken a number of those Superfund sites off the priorities list. Now one would think that if they haven't been cleaned up, um, they still should be on the list. Tell us about the qualifications and, and what it takes and what the federal standards are versus the state standards. Are, are they stricter? Well, these federal standards offer Superfund sites. Now, these are the sites that are not just a little bit polluted. These are sites that are imminent and substantial hazards to people's health and the environment. So the standards that are on the Superfund list are much more stringent, um, and we have more things being done there. The difficulty, of course, in Washington now is that the Trump administration is not environmentally sensitive at all. They're trying to rein in some of the things we've done to try to get these sites cleaned up um, inappropriately. And I suspect uh, the, the country is starting to wake up to the environmental hazards for this type of watering down of standards. I guess it all comes down to funding and who's going to pay for it and who should pay for yeah. it. Now, originally, the polluters were expected to pay for the cleanup, uh, as far as I can remember. What has changed now? Are we, the taxpayers, paying most of the bill over the last two and a half decades or well, so? Well, the cardinal principle of the law was the polluter should pay. Accordingly, the law was created when we wrote it, assessing a relatively small, for them, fee on the chemical companies, the petrochemical companies, oil companies, and so on. That expired, and then during the period of time when Newt Gingrich was in charge of the Congress, that the bill was killed, and so the, no, the, the polluters are no longer paying, the general taxpayer is paying, which is terrible, but it's the case. Trying to put that assessment back on those companies is not going to be an easy thing to do, but it really should be done. Having been there in the beginning, as you were, um, what do you think needs to be done now going forward as we become more aware of climate change and all of the pollutants and, and, and the way this is affecting all of us and, and the way we live today? Well, we have a good system if the system is executed. Something called the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act said this is what you have to do if you have hazardous materials. You can't just randomly just dispose of it. You've got to make sure that it's taken care of and protecting the land citizens. So the, land, the law is good, and the combination of Superfund, which was to clean up the old sites, and RECRA, this new law, 
to say we should have no new sites being created by preventing bad practices. That should take it. But you have to have an administration, particularly in Washington, that believes in the law and is rigorous in enforcing the law. We don't have that right now. Governor Florio, thank you very much for making all of us more aware of this as a concern here in our state in New Jersey, still with so many Superfund sites. Yes. Thank you. Jim Florio with Kent Manahan. On well, next week's On the Record, State Treasurer Elizabeth Marmoyo will be our guest. NJTV will carry the governor's budget address live at 2 p.m. Tuesday. I'm Michael Aaron. Thanks for watching. Major funding for On the Record with Michael Aaron is provided by the Fuel Merchants Association of New Jersey, the National Oil Heat Research Alliance and BioHeat, the evolution of oil heat, NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Promotional support is provided by Insider NJ, a political intelligence network dedicated to New Jersey political news. Insider NJ is committed to giving serious political players an interactive forum for ideas, discussion, and insight. Online at InsiderNJ.com. Funding for Governor's Perspectives with Kent Manahan is made possible by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, committed to helping Americans lead healthier lives and get the care they need. Additional funding provided by Connell Foley, LLP, Seton Hall University, and Seton Hall Law, and by New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group.